transparency from your supplier of insurance, sometimes many miles to feed, and this affects the cost, as I said before. Um, I think we spoke pretty pretty broadly about that and the transparency. Um, insurance is your broker or is taking a fee, you need to know what that fee is um, and is it reasonable for what they're doing. The problem that you're going to have, again, not, not to go over the point, is that you might be one property into your management company and if the management company has got 100 properties its insurance broker takes him to the Liverpool game every Saturday sits him in a box and buys him loads of beer because he's putting 100 properties with him and they're earning a, earning a good living out of it so it's something that, that, that you need to be transparent and I think it comes back to the management agents, the management company and making sure you, you've got the right one. We must be with the wrong broker because don't you think it's the our policy covers around two billion pounds worth of properties, and I've never been taken before. Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll have to speak after. We'll have to speak after. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, we've, we've, we've spoke a bit earlier about the schedule and the wording and the warranties. Um, a typical policy wording is going to be about seventy to hundred pages long, um, with a lot of here whiffs and with whom's and a lot of stuff. Your broker is your trusted advisor and um, what he tells you in a summary should be what that policy is. Um, you should familiarise yourself with the general headings of a policy where the, um, the policy schedule and then obviously any warranties. So it, it, it's, it's how the insurers get out of paying claims and it, it's what you need to be aware of. Um, and I, I think that is it. I don't know if we've, we've We've run through some questions, so if there's anything else. Just a quick one, because we've, this has been a longer session than we, we've planned for, but how would you want to... And just a very quick one. Um, as I said, I've been going through the uh, property on business service bill. Um, it, in the insurance uh, bracket of that, it says that your management agent should have insurance to cover your funds, as in ticket funds and stuff like that. But also, it says you should have insurance cover to cover their uh, negligence. Yes. And I was just wondering, are those two things, you know, in a, a typical normal policy or the add-ons? Yeah, the the professional negligence of your management company would be covered under their professional indemnity policy. And they should show us that. They should have a professional indemnity policy which covers. So if you go back to them and say our building's burnt down, you've provided us this policy and it doesn't cover us. Um, it goes back to the advice that they're given. Professional of our insurance or no, uh, that's separate. that's a professional indemnity policy covers the advice a professional gives to his or her customers. So, as a customer of the management company, they are giving you advice. If that advice leads to a loss, then you've got a claim against them. Now, they have to have in place the professional indemnity to cover that. It might be slightly different on the insurance goes back if you're an appointed representative and you put the liability directly back to the broker, it could then mean that the broker's professional indemnity insurance would pick up because they sold the policy. It then comes back to what you told the management company and what the management company presented to the brokers to then them to present to the insurance market. So because you're going, the train's going three ways, you need to make sure that it's right. It has to be so. Yeah, you you as a as a management company, they could say, okay, our block of flats is here. There's a hundred flats. We have ninety professional and ten DSS, and it gets presented that to the insurance company, and the insurance company then rates it on that. You might have it the other way around: ten professional lets and ninety DSS. You send that to your management company, and they go, premium's going to be a lot with that. We'll we'll tell them it's fifty fifty. They tell them it's fifty fifty. They rate it on that there's a claim, they find out it was wrong, then you, it goes back through the train to see who has actually done what. You've got to make sure when you're, that the proposal that your management company sends to the broker is right, or you need to make sure that when, presumably they send you some type of proposal or declaration form each year, which you have to complete, um, to make sure that what you're presenting to them, they're presenting back to the, back to the broker. And again, it comes back to the, whether they're an appointed representative or a member of the FCA and how much dealings they can actually, actually
Sure. And insurance of our um, funds. And in, in that insurance, if our funds were insured to say, look, you know, they're 1.2 million or whatever, that is a sort of assured, insured sort of thing that can go walkies anywhere or whatever. Is, would we have a claim on mismanagement of our funds? Possibly, yeah. Again, I think probably Ben might be able to answer better. I the fact have a that section. Yeah. We have a section on this later on. Yeah, so um, are you talking about money held by the management company yeah, on your behalf? behalf. Yeah. I presumably money to protect, I, mean, I, don't, yeah. I don't know, is it out? Again, I think in large part it comes back to whether or not um, your agent is a member of any trade association or regulated by anyone. Uh, there is nothing in law that says any company has to have professional indemnity insurance. Um, and so if your managing agent is completely unregulated, there is a possibility that they don't have professional indemnity insurance. And therefore, if they give you negligent advice, you don't have a policy you can claim on. Um, if they are a member of Armour, if they're a member of Ricks, if they're a member of, uh, of, of other bodies, then it will be a requirement of membership that they have professional indemnity insurance in place, so that if they do do something wrong, there is a policy you can go back to. Um, I, again, I, I'd have to bear to, to your better judgment, but certainly our professional indemnity insurance uh, as a business includes fidelity cover, which means if anyone steals your money, um, you have a claim against our professional indemnity policy. Um, and there are certain caveats associated with that. Um, that it, you know, if one of my members of account staff is, is, has got their hand in the till and I don't know anything about it, um, then our policy would kick in. If one of our members of account staff has got their hand in the till and I do know about it, um, then our professional indemnity insurance possibly wouldn't kick in because they would be saying, well, you as a business were compliant with, with what was going on. Um, so it comes down to, to the individual wording of your managing agent's policy. Um, but they certainly should have professional indemnity insurance in place and that, that should include fidelity cover, which would cover your money. Um, any managing agent that's regulated by RICS, they have a client money protection policy in place, uh, which is provided by RICS which means that you as a client, if your money disappears from that managing agent's firm, you can go to the RICS and actually say to them, claim against the RICS's policy that a member of their company, a member of their organisation has misappropriated your funds. Um, ARMA actually doesn't provide uh, client money protection um, for various reasons, which I won't go into because I've talked all morning about it. Um, but, so, so, I mean, it's just down to the individual circumstances surrounding that really. Well, as part of membership of, for example, the Property Ombudsman Service, which I know our management company has signed up to, do they have to prove these, these things like indemnity insurance and stuff? Not for the Ombudsman Service itself. Um, it should have it, as it written. If, if they, the Ombudsman Service is just a redress scheme, so there are no rules about, the Ombudsman Service doesn't provide any rules that says in order for you to be a member of the Property Ombudsman Service, you have to have this, that and the other in place. Um, what you will find is that being a member of the Ombudsman Service is a requirement of membership of certain other bodies. So you cannot be regulated by RICS, you cannot be a member of ARMA unless you are a member of the Ombudsman Service. And if you're regulated by RICS or you're a member of ARMA, then you have to have PI cover in place. But you cannot be a member of ARMA or not be a member of RICS and still sign up to an Ombudsman scheme which means that you could be a member of the Ombudsman and not have PI in place. Um, so it, it, I'm afraid it's, it is slightly complicated. <laughs> and on that complicated note, I'm going to, to draw a line for a moment.